A Celtic state of mind has been named as one of seven finalists in the Best International Podcast category at this year's Football Content Awards. We won the Best Football Podcast Award in 2018 and it is a real achievement to be finalists once again. Thank you all for your ongoing support over the last three years. If you have been enjoying our daily content, then feel free to vote for a Celtic state of mind at footballcontentawards.com. I have added the link to the bio of this episode and the instructions and further links are also on axom.net. You can also vote on Twitter by simply tweeting I am voting for at axompod in at the underscore FCAs for hashtag best podcast. Thank you again for all your support. Welcome to A Celtic State of Mind, I'm Paul John Dykes and once again I'm joined by Kevin Graham for Screamer Celica. Welcome back Kevin. Good evening Paul, how are you this evening? I'm very well and I'm looking forward to hearing what your latest album and era is. So what have you selected for us tonight? Tonight we're going back to uh, April 2012 and the album is Richard Hawley Standing at the Sky's Edge. Now, interesting fact that I found out about the title of this album today is Sky's Edge. The title gives a feeling that you're actually standing at the sky's edge, that Mm -hmm. you're on the edge of the sky. But seemingly, Sky Edge is an estate on the outskirts of Sheffield, where Richard Hawley comes from. And it's on a hillside and it looks into Sheffield city centre. And it used to be quite a rough estate. So there you go. That's what Sky's Edge is. It's one of these things, Kevin, with a lot of these industrial areas, often from that comes incredible art, incredible music. And of course, Richard Hawley. My introduction to Hawley, although I didn't even know he was on the stage, was when I went to see the Long Pigs. First time I went to see Long Pigs, which I, I was a fan, I've got to say, of particularly the, the debut album. Their debut album for me was excellent. I still listen to it to this very day. Is it an album that you explored at all? The sun is often out. It didn't reach my radar whatsoever. I'll probably need to go and check it out because I do actually do check out your uh, recommendations and I quite like the Bon Iver stuff that you've, that you've recommended over the last few weeks. Richard Hawley basically only came to my attention uh, with this album and I heard the single, I'm sure it was, Leave Your Body behind you from this album on Radcliffe and McConey and I thought it was fantastic. I thought it was a fantastic song. Sort of neo-psychedelic rock I had exploding guitars. This album, which I love about this album, is there's loads of songs over five minutes. I love songs that are over five minutes. There's a couple at seven minutes. What was the point? Of, the Ramones, fantastic, three minutes. Get in there and get out there. But sometimes you need to let a song breathe, and this album really does this. I think this kind of shows, if I was in a band, I would probably want to sound like this album, actually. There's elements of early verve, there's elements of spiritualised, doves are in there as well, and it's on the more accessible side to psychedelic, the new psychedelic music that kicks about nowadays, eh? So I'm I'm quite glad that we've done this album this week because I went back and listened to it. It It's really, really a phenomenal gut punch of an album. Unlike a lot of the psychedelic stuff that I do listen to, it's got decent lyrics, which Holly was always, now that I've investigated them more after this album, that Holly was, his, his lyrics are fantastic as well. I think there's one of the songs called, I think it's Seek It, he says that he goes and gets his fortune told and he's going to meet someday with eyes of blue. Then in the next line he goes, but your eyes are green. So it's just a fantastic line that always sticks out to me. So again, I mean, this is his sixth album and I'd never heard of the fella until this album. So maybe that says more about me than anything. It's the beauty of music though, Kevin. You know, these things, uh, often you are waylaid with other interests or other music or other events at that time. 
And as I say, when I went to see Long Pigs, I, I didn't know that a part of that band and a reason for the sound that Long Pigs had was obviously Richard Holly. And what I would say is the recommendations are coming in early on this podcast because the sun is often out. I can guarantee you that you would like that. I can guarantee you that it would appeal to you. I mean, this is a, an album, you know, it was just littered with superb singles as well. I mean, you're looking, you, you will have heard some of them. She said, Jesus Christ, on and on, Lost Myself. What an incredible album. The songs were written by Crispin Hunt. A second album came along. There was a third album that was scrapped, record company issues. And of course, they split up and Holly went away and joined Pulp for a spell before going solo. And thank God he did go solo because it's like you say, you listen to some of these songs on that particular album and some of these other albums and there's the soaring quality, isn't there? It's like, it's so uplifting. There's the heartfelt melodies and lyrics. There's a romanticism to it. He's a great storyteller, which I know appeals to you, Kevin. And I finally went to see him at the Barras in 2012 where he was actually touring this album. So I seen... This album, live at the Barrowlands in 2012, quite early on in the gig, Rich Tolley made a comment, these people must be rich, they've spent £25 on a ticket and they're talking through it. And I remember at that point, anyone who spoke during the set was basically shhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhh
League which we did Samaras was immense in Europe that season but domestically the fair was up and down and you can maybe give the players a bit of leeway considering did we really need to go full fall in the league to win the league obviously we got a few scares St Murren being the obvious one in that semi-final as you say when looking back on it everybody remembers the Dyla one eh, but we really should have won a treble that year really should have done it and we got to the Scottish Cup final we won the Scottish Cup final but I've got some good memories of that side Gary Hooper Chris Commons Joe Ledley the fact that Nike had gave us a cracking kit for the 125th anniversary the birth of Victor Wanyama as a major player for us and Fraser Foster he signed permanently so it was a decent decent season an unusual season for somebody like myself and anybody who was used to having Celtic Rangers games and them not been there there was like a big pressure had been taken off your shoulders and it was it was fun it it was fun it was it's quite hard to describe what it was like and I really do think that attitude that sort of feeling got through to the players and the be all and end all was Europe which we ended up in the last 16 in the Champions League yeah absolutely so it did work out in our favour in many ways but there was a different dynamic to the domestic game. You mentioned the kit there, Kevin, and obviously we do a Celtic match-worn jersey podcast every single week. I always remember all three sets of kit for this particular season were classics. The, the home jersey with this invisible sponsor, if you like, underneath the badge and the, the thinner green and white hoops, the round neck. But in the first game, you'll recall when we beat Aberdeen one nothing, and it was Chris Commons that scored. We were wearing black socks that day. I don't know if you recall that. That's right, yeah, I, we, I, I do recall that, yeah, yes. And we ditched, we ditched the black socks pretty soon after and they were replaced with the, the white ones. But that season was also the birth, obviously, of uh, Tony Watt. And I remember, and I think I've mentioned this before, watching him in the game in August against Inverness Cali and I was in a, the Jolly Roger bar having gone over for the Sancta Pauli experience and sitting there watching the game on a laptop that was given to us by the, the barmaid and watching this young kid scoring two goals against Inverness Cali Thistle and thinking wow who's this because it goes back to the old argument you and I have already had on this podcast about Celtic do not produce goal scoring strikers and I know we actually signed Tony Watt from Airdrie United but he was a young kid coming through 18 years of age and of course he, he was introduced that day up at Inverness with a couple of goals that was to be relevant later on and we'll get to the, the game that we're going to speak about obviously but you look at some of the disappointments you, you mentioned the St Mirren game going out it was just yeah we're a better team than St Mirren you know we beat them 5 nothing away from home Kevin this season in the league but it was just their year it was just their year wasn't it they were going to win the first trophy since 1987 you know Danny Lennon had assembled if you look back at that side Danny Lennon had assembled a very handy side and he also had an 18 year old John McGinn coming through uh, you know coming into his own he had the experience in there the, the likes of journeyman players if you like Jimmy Goodwin and um, David Van Zanten was in that team and Gary Teal but they worked that team worked Stephen Thompson up front and they brought in the Portuguese striker remember Ismael Concalves oh, that's right, he aye. caused us no end of trouble He's still playing his football. He's in Japan now. Remember, he was racially abused while he was at Tyne Castle. He was, yes. Uh-huh. But, I mean, it was just one of the ones when you look at it now and you, you look at St Mirren winning that cup and it was just their year, Kevin. It was one of the things. So, I've said before, I want to win every single trophy. And it's easy to say, ah, you know, if we had came through against St Mirren, we'd have beaten Hearts in the final. But it was just their year and they won it. Which is quite weird. We're sitting here just now, won the last 11 trophies available to us. And... Talking about that St Murn game, you're saying it was their year, I basically says Celtic were absolutely terrible on the day. And it just shows you how consistent this team has yeah. been in one-off cup ties that they've never been picked off. Exactly. And it, for me, that is phenomenal, and I've said that quite a few times. I mean, that day, the, the, the semi-final, Mulgrew gave away a penalty and missed a penalty as well, if I remember mm-hmm. correctly. As you say, sometimes somebody's name's on the cup, and he quite rightly pointed out that St Mun had a half-decent side at that point, where a decent manager who seems to have been badly treated in the game. But his his managerial career since 2014 has not gone the way you would have expected, has it? No, and even then you can go back to St Murn sacking him. And uh, this is this is me going to sound like a big time fan, a big club fan, but I sometimes wonder what the boards of St Murn and such want. When I mean, you look at how many managers St Murn have went through since Danny Lennon, and none of them have done any better than Danny Lennon. 
Danny Lennon delivered a trophy for them. And you wonder, what is your criteria for success for these football clubs? And sometimes it's easier as an outsider looking in. And I know that fans of other clubs look at Celtic fans and go, you're spoiled. Oh, but you lose a game every couple of months and it's Armageddon. It's a crisis. You should try being us. So they've got their view of what we think success is. And, and we've got our view of what we think they should term success as well. But sometimes I do look at these clubs and go, what do you actually want? Because I sometimes think these chairmen don't have have a clue what they want as well. It's, it's strange, it's, it's, it's probably the instant nature of the modern day fan, they want instant success uh, and if you didn't give it them within five games, you're under pressure. What do they know of defeat when they've never tasted success? It's one of the things, it's easy for them to say it's easy for us. You know what I mean? It really is because success doesn't come easy and when you don't get it, then the the failure to win a game or the failure to win a trophy, you know, it's one of these things that it's almost a safe bet sometimes. You know, if, you, if you're if you going to support something nobody expects to do well, Kevin, you're never going to be disappointed because you know what you're getting and to have ambition should never be scoffed at. To try and better yourself, grow your fan base, win trophies, progress in Europe, you should never scoff at that. But, you know, it's a mentality of fans of certain provincial clubs where they always see Celtic as a target and um, you know treat you like a spoiled uh, football fan. But as you say, when you look at what Danny Lennon achieved at St Mirren, it will be a long time before that happens again. So I think you're absolutely right. But it's just unfortunate that his career hasn't gone as well as you would have expected. But back to the season 2012 to 2013. And as you say, we're focusing on Europe at this stage. You were talking about a topsy-turvy performance domestically. And I think that can be exemplified in the fact that we needed a replay to beat Arbroath in the Scottish Cup, right? I mean, remember that? Adam Matthews scoring the goal. Yes, it was a crack. <laughs> in the same season that you need a replay to beat Arbroath, one of the most famous victories in the history of Celtic Football Club takes place. We go back to saying, and people might think that it's just old nonsense and tosh, but it was was almost fairy tale like in that we're celebrating our 125th birthday of the club and we beat what at that time were regarded as the greatest club side in the world in Barcelona. What's your memories of that game? Tense night, fantastic result. Um, I'll probably steal the Neil Lennon quote <laughs> when I actually say that when we went 2 nothing up, I did turn round and actually say we might get a draw now because <laughs> that, was, that, that was your mindset at the time. We hung on. Uh, Fraser Foster was fantastic. Mm -hmm. Our defence that night, Lennon got his tactics spot on and we, we have to give a nod to Jose Mourinho because that's where the tactical template came from, Jose Mourinho's Inter Milan and what they had done against Barcelona the previous season, which was basically give the ball on the wings, let them have it on the wings and let them try and cross it. And if you've got big enough centre-halves, you should be able to deal with the crosses coming into the box. And that's what we did that night. We just we gave them the space. We were that narrow and gave them the space down the wings. But everything was fired into the box. Big Kelvin Wilson and it was Effie Ambrose won absolutely everything. The, the two full-backs were immense. Miku up front ran his absolute socks off it was just a hard working team performance and don't get us wrong we were absolutely battered for the for the whole 90 minutes or 96 minutes or whatever it was it is one of our greatest results in our history it helped us qualify uh, definitely because nobody expected us to get that three points it helped us qualify from that group but the away leg in the new camp as well we got beat with a last minute oh. goal which was sickening James Forrest never tracked was it Jordi Alba back so Lennon had us set up well in Europe that season and beating Barcelona I often say half jokingly that we killed that Barcelona side mm -hmm. Because they were never the same after we beat them. I um, think that's a fair enough assertion. Sometimes, you know, the wheels can come off, Kevin. And, you know, the Tony Watt thing, I love all the wee fairy tale elements of Celtic stories. You talk about winning the European Cup, you've got the Bertie Old moment in the tunnel when he's singing a Celtic song. You've got the guys wearing the boots with the Adidas stripes painted in Tippex the night before by Neely Mocken. You've got Ronnie Simpson with his back heel. All these wee things, all these wee elements, Kevin, that make up the bigger story all these memorable anecdotes and then obviously the big thing with Tony Watt is when he's just walking as a young boy with a tracksuit on past the Barcelona players 
you know, whistling the song and they're all looking at him as if, you know, is that a ball boy, you know? But he was the boy that ended up slaying them that night. What a moment for Tony Watt. It must have been difficult though for an 18 year old to take that and I think he's told the story that he went on a bender that night, didn't he? And ended up in a club with Paolo Nettini and all this kind of stuff. Can you really blame him? He's 18, he was put on the park with the instructions, just run about, <laughs> just try and keep them occupied. Then he's on the park a couple of minutes and one of the greatest midfielders ever to play the game, Zavi completely misses a ball and he's through one-on-one with a goalkeeper. Is there any pressure on him to score? Like, there's probably none. He buries it and his life's changed forever. Like, that, at that precise moment in time, he, his life has completely altered its path. He can die now on that goal for the rest of his career. Fair play to him, he hasn't, but he's always going to get remembered for that goal. It's a bit like David Marshall is always going to be remembered for the game that he had in the new camp. Mm-hmm. Irvin Welsh is always going to get remembered for his first book train spot and eh yeah. so sometimes if you peak too early you can never reach that again and I, I thought Watt was a decent player but his career when we spoke about him before he seems to have followed the same pattern wherever he's went great start then tails away so I don't know what it is there eh? but he seems a genuinely nice enough guy who maybe admits now that he hasn't done certain things correctly mm-hmm. in his career but he's still got that moment eh? he can still 20, 30 years time he can still turn round and go did I tell you about my goal against Barcelona? That's, that's something, eh? It has to be something. Of course. And we talk about his career, and at the end of the day, Kevin, he's playing for the third best team in Scotland at the moment. And, you know, I know that he's had spells in Belgium and in England and, and so forth. But he's a player who you think to yourself, when he scored that goal, there's no guarantees. Did you honestly expect him to play 10 years at Celtic, 15 years at Celtic? Probably not. Very, very few players do. It's one of these things with, with Tony Watt. I think that he has probably knuckled down now and he's still got enough years in him to make a make a lot out of his career. This particular season, you look at some of the, the results that we had, Kevin, before we go into the actual departure from European football and, you know, the 4-3 game against Aberdeen. You always remember that goal by Samaras. We beat Dundee United 4-3 in the Scottish Cup after extra time. Dundee United managed at that time by Jackie McNamara. Celtic, at that point, point as you say domestically it's not as though we were steamrolling over teams but you know we still won the double when it comes to Juventus knocking us out of Europe I remember and you're looking at it as a 5 nothing aggregate scoreline but particularly at Celtic Park they were they were into all the dark arts weren't they? For somebody who fell in love with Italian football in the early 90s it was sickening but great to see what they got up to and I don't think we were streetwise enough that night I, I really do think at half time Neil Lennon, Johan, should have told one of the players to go through the goalkeeper, the first corner kick that you get. They should have t- told Gary Hooper, you fall on the deck as soon as somebody touches you. We should have started playing them at their game, but what I, f- what I still find, I still laugh about this, and what I found amazing was that the level of detail that UV went to, they scouted the referee, and they knew that the referee wouldn't give the tugging in the box. You have to applaud them for that level of dark art, <laughs> that level of detail detail against a game I mean they were favourites to beat us mm-hmm. um, they were a better they were a better side than us they probably didn't need to go into that level of detail but for them to gain any sort of advantage whatsoever they scouted the referee and they were willing to do it and I think I've, I've got to doff my cap to them for that it was, it was frustrating on the night didn't get me wrong completely distraught on the night and fuming and spitting feathers but I don't think we were street wise enough we weren't street wise enough against them no. we should have started playing them at their own game huh? and maybe it wouldn't have made any difference in the tie but if one yammer flattening Buffon maybe would have roused us a wee bit for 10-15 minutes I think Neil Lennon's street wise enough now as a manager I think the second time round Kevin if we're ever faced with such a set of circumstances we'll deal with it differently I think that that is the benefit of having Neil Lennon Mark II in our corner now but yeah we'll always remember it for Barcelona in any, in any case you know this is almost like a footnote in the Barcelona story isn't it and you know we've spoken about you know winning the Scottish Cup against the Hibs side and we wore the, the fantastic uh, black strip that if you wore the short sleeve one and turned the sleeves up it was uh, green white and orange for the tricolour which was a, a nice wee detail they'd beaten us at the end of the previous year the end of the previous calendar year and it was a Lee Griffiths goal you know no less that defeated 
defeated us 1-0 but, and I just remember the actual game itself we won the game fairly easily didn't we? We did just to take us back when we were talking about fans or provincial clubs not saying that we take success or have the same feelings with them because we get to cup finals quite regularly that 4-3 game against Dundee United was probably the most nervous I was in any game that season mm. because we had such a lot riding on that game we had been put out the previous semi-final by St Murn, as we discussed, and we've got a Dundee United side that's going toe to with us, and it goes into extra time, and we had to get through that game. Now, there was a lot of pressure on us in that game, just when you looked at our previous visit to Hamden against St Murn, eh? so I was really nervous that game. I remember being over the moon and really, really celebrating when we actually got the winner, mm-hmm. and we got to the cup final, but as you say in the cup final, it was a bit of a stroll. It was a bit of a non-event. Hibs done what Hibs usually do in a Scottish Cup finals and just didn't turn up on the day. But it was a good end to the season. I remember the Green Brigade had quite a smart TIFO that day. It was a TIFO of Brother Walford. That was a good day out. It was a cup final on a Sunday as well, eh? Because the Champions League final was on the Saturday. So that was a bit strange, going to a Scottish Cup final on a Sunday. Not as strange as not going to a Scottish Cup final at all during the season. But Hooper scored a a double that day. It was a cracking kit again. We've already spoke about the kits. Gary Hooper can go down as a cup final winning striker, which I think he wholly deserves. I'm pleased for guys in that team like Joe Ledley who grew to love us mm-hmm. even though he wasn't a sell. Gary Hooper, fantastic as well. Big Kelvin Wilson, he was much maligned but he had a decent season that season. So, aye, uh, got good memories of that season. Uh, it was a strange, strange season. You remember the good stuff but when you start looking back over the results some of, some of the games were absolutely terrible. But you beat Barcelona, you got to the last 16 in the Champions League, you won the league and you also won the cup. That's not a bad season, eh? Exactly. And when you look back on the season, there's always a soundtrack to that particular season. We've already spoken about Richard Hawley. What other music were you listening to during that particular period, Kevin? At that time, the main main other album I listened to that year was by a little-known California band called the Alalaz. They released their debut album this year. And I'm going to recommend anybody go and search this album out on Spotify. It's the Alalaz Alalaz. It's the, the their debut album. How how could I explain how it sounds? Do you remember the club scene in Quadrafina where Jimmy and his mates are in the club dancing away with the sunglasses on and you've got Sting dancing as the <laughs> ace face? Mm-hmm. The Alalaz should be the band that's playing, soundtracking them dancing. It's like the sound of Northern Soul getting took over the California desert in a VW camper van. It's fantastic. An absolutely fantastic album. It touches sounds like Love, who we both love. Well Birds, named band. The Yardbirds, The Kinks, mm. a little known garage band called The Zombies. It's a fantastic album and I would recommend that anybody goes and seeks it out on Spotify. Definitely. Well, I'll be doing that. I've recommended you check out Long Pigs. What other tunes were you listening to? I got big into an album by a band called Toy their debut album as well which was called Toy that band were very loud shoegazy kraut rock type uh, I saw them in King Tut's and they were absolutely fantastic just rewind two seconds to the Alalaz I saw them in broadcast in Glasgow on a Monday night and there was there was a lot of, what could you say that there was a few scooter boys and mods were there on this Monday night and the guy in front of me was dressed as a hybrid of Bruce Foxton and Sting for Quadrophenia. I've seen plenty of guys trying to look like Paul Weller. I've seen plenty of guys trying to look like Jimmy for Quadrophenia, but I've never seen anybody try to look like Sting or Bruce Foxton. So fair play to the fella, he actually did pull it off. So Toy, and also, we mentioned it last week, Spiritualised, released Sweetheart, Sweet Light that year. So again, another album that I played to death. Love the first track on it, the Velvet sounding Hey Jane. And the last track, So Long You Pretty Thing as well. Fantastic. Amazing, as is virtually everything that Jason Pierce has ever done. Yeah, Spiritualised, 
always guaranteed to raise a smell in this household. Any other LPs that you would recommend? Another American band, Dive, but it's spelled D-I-I-V, released their debut album, Ocean, that year. What can I say? It sounds like, well, let's say that the new ride stuff has been quite heavily influenced by this, this band's album. Uh, so I would recommend to check that out as well. Some of the bands, some of the LPs that spring to my mind you mentioned Bruce Fox and then Paul Weller was obviously still releasing prolifically as he has done when you look at his his, uh, discography Kevin I mean it's quite incredible the output of Paul Weller and it's one of the ones where my interest in Weller comes and goes it comes and goes depending on the mood he's in or the music he's making because obviously he's continually evolving as Weller but he's always undeniably Paul Weller and there's always the roots of Paul Weller in there so I think I could safely say I would enjoy any Paul Weller album but obviously I've got my favourites in this particular year he released Sonic Kicks he was looking as uh, smart and as mod as ever on the front cover of that particular album but it is it's one of these things with with Weller when you look at his vast discography it's bloody impressive I mean the jam followed up by the Style Council so he's got 12 albums under his belt before he goes solo he then goes solo and he's released another 14 and and he's uh, he's due to release another album this year which will be album number 27 it's quite incredible to be able to release albums over such a period of time and still remain relevant Kevin definitely and I think he's got a very very faithful fan, fan base and with such a vast body of work, I mean, I'm well versed up on the jam back catalogue. One of the first bands where youth club discos and used to play Town Called Malice and you would jump off the seats kidding on. You were, you were Paul Weller. Well, I used to anyway, while everybody else was dancing to Madonna. I was wanting madness in the jam. So it's an a incredible body of work and for somebody he must be, he looks damn fine as well <laughs> for his age and I always wonder about that. I wonder, always wonder how these guys who are cool as anything never lose their hair. What, what is it? What is it? Is it a creative thing? I think it's a wig. Him, Johnny so? Marr and Noel Gallagher all go to the same wig makers, mate. Do you think there's a bit of Lee Griffiths hair transplants going on there? Nah, it's just a wig. It's just yeah, an old-fashioned, so- it's just a, an old-fashioned wig. And of course... Weller was born on the 25th of May as well, so he's one of the golden children, you know. Wow, did McKenney was born on the 25th of May? It's easy for any artist to overstay their welcome, Kevin. This is, I think, what I'm getting at. But Weller continues to produce and continues to produce. And I think that, you know, another example of that, and I'm not comparing them in terms of the musical styles, was, was David Bowie. Always able to change with the times, always able to stay just that wee step ahead. You know, sometimes they were in vogue, sometimes they weren't. And it didn't matter because they had that fan base that was was always going to be loyal to them. There's a creative freedom there as well because record companies will give them time, give them space and let them do what they want because they know it will sell a certain amount. So there's no really any pressure on these guys. I mean, you've got to remember that Weller, Weller was a person non grata really until Oasis. And they started hanging about with them again and released what would have been Wildwood. Yeah would have released at the height of yeah that's right what was termed Britpop so he was the mod father of that kind of movement and the thing with that as well was he had come back as the Paul Weller movement and that was quickly ditched and he just went you know Paul Weller started releasing acoustic songs and the songwriting quality was there in Wildwood and Stanley Road and it's just kind of moved on for there a friend of the podcast Edgar Summertime he played on the tour with Paul Weller when he was he was uh, touring Heliocentric and he was a bass players some brilliant footage of them for example playing uh, on the Jules Holland show and there's there's Edgar playing bass and you know you look at particularly the early weather but some of the, the mannerisms even now and you know he's kind of chipped out the same granite as Steve Marriott it's, it's obviously there's a big small faces influence in the early Paul Weller style I, I would suggest and obviously if you're going to have your influences I think it was Ian Brown that said that if you're going to have influences make sure they're not Elton John you know if you're going to try and replicate anybody Steve Marriott's a good start is he not? Aye you need to be true to your Yourself. There was I, I listened to an interview with James Allen for Las Vegas, who we spoke about last week, and he says if you're not true to yourself, you'll get found out very, very quickly. And I think that's true. With, I think that's true with these guys who have go, who have had long longevity, and Weller's probably one of them. That no matter the the passing fads or fashion, he's always been true. I mean, he ditched the the jam when they were at their peak and formed the Style Council. He's been true to himself there. 
uh, because not many not many 21 year olds would have had the guts to end the jam and there's a good documentary about the jam and you can still see that Bruce Foxton and Rick Butler, the drummer, are still a bit bemused to this day why the jam ended. You've got to take your hat off to him and, you know, Steve Marriott done the same with Small Faces. The great quote for Paul Weller, I'm still a mod, I'll always be a mod, you can bury me a mod. We'll just leave it at that. But I mentioned Edgar Summertime, he released an album this year as well, Edgar Jones, Sense of Harmony. As with everything Edgar's ever done, go and check it out. Love or loathe him because of the hype, I guess, but Jake Bug released his eponymously named debut album. And again, I don't know if it's one of these things sometimes when you get that initial surge of popularity, it's sometimes difficult to see through that, Kevin, and just listen to the music on its own merits. But when you go back to an album like that, when all the hype has disappeared, you can enjoy the music. Jake Bug, young guy coming through. I remember he uh, he had a gig booked at PJ Malloy's in Dunfermline and he stuck to his guns and he went and played that gig on a Thursday night. Tickets were £8.50 and on the Sunday he was number one in the UK charts. You know, you, you couldn't buy tickets for that gig that night because he was just on the up and up. Not a bad year for music, not a bad year to be a Celtic fan as well. It was a strange year, a really strange year. I mean, it was the first year, as we've mentioned, the Fout Rangers and so... It was a wee, bit of, a wee bit of adjustment, but happy memories, good memories of the year overall. Absolutely. And Kevin, the only thing that's left for me to say is uh, thank you once again for being on A Celtic State of Mind. And I look forward to hearing what your next album is going to be uh, so we can discuss Celtic and music. No problem, Paul. Thanks for having me on. <laughs> Celtic State of Mind has been named as one of seven finalists in the Best International Podcast category at this year's Football Content Awards. We won the Best Football Podcast Award in 2018 and it is a real achievement to be finalists once again. Thank you all for your ongoing support over the last three years. If you have been enjoying our daily content then feel free to vote for a Celtic State of Mind at footballcontentawards.com. I have added the link to the bio of this episode and the instructions and further links are also on axom.net. You can also vote on Twitter by simply tweeting I am voting for at axompod in at the underscore FCAs for hashtag best podcast. Thank you again for all your support.